Thank you everyone for being here today. My name is Tanesh Boja. I'm an undergraduate student at Yale University. And today I'm happy to be presenting my project, Sufficient COVID-19 Quarantine and Testing on International Travelers from China. As mentioned before, I've been working on this project with the Townsend Laboratory at the Yale School of Public Health. And I'm excited to be presenting it with all today. As I'm sure we're all aware, the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic has left a lasting impact on our global society. As of September, there have been over 776 million cases of COVID-19 that have been reported, with the true prevalence of infection potentially being even higher, with many cases not being reported by any government agencies. One particular response to the COVID-19 pandemic that was really particularly interesting was in China, where they used what was called the zero COVID policy. Zero COVID policy was meant to mitigate the effects of the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic using strict lockdowns, contact tracing, and mass testing of all Chinese citizens. And while China did report fewer cases in other nations using this policy, due to food shortages, economic damage, and social strain, many Chinese citizens were discontent with the rollout and started protesting. As such, in December 2022, China completely repealed all of the policies regarding zero COVID, leaving the country back to where it was before. However, many scientific journals and news outlets began to question whether this was the right move, suggesting that potentially by repealing the zero COVID policy, China had but maybe caused more damage than it did before. And accordingly, in December 2022 and January 2023, China had seen hundreds of millions of cases of COVID-19. With fear that this increase of infection within China would translate to an increase of infection within their own borders, many foreign countries imposed harsh travel restrictions on Chinese travelers requiring testing, quarantining, and even banning Chinese travelers altogether. However, we wanted to determine whether this strict quarantine was actually necessary for some of these countries, which may already have a high prevalence of infection within their own borders. To analyze this, we use what was called the sufficient quarantine model. The sufficient quarantine model aims to find this optimal quarantine, and we define the optimal quarantine as a minimum duration such that the number of infections with travel and without travel are completely equalized. This model, developed in my lab in a paper published by Wells et al., defines a more quantitative public health modeling method to determine what this optimal quarantine should be, rather than justifying quarantines through political, social, and economic means. So to break down what this model really looks at, it takes a country, for example, some origin country B, and looks at a destination country A, and wants to see what quarantine that country A should place on travelers from country B, so that the number of infections within the destination country country A, if you can see my mouse, will make sure that there's no increase of infection with travel, not necessarily to mitigate the most infections possible. And we start defining where these infections are coming from, whether they're coming from people who live in country A, from travelers from country B coming into this destination, or from travelers mixing between the two countries overall. And by determining where these infections are coming from and determining what quarantines would have what effects on which specific cases, we're able to find a graph like this. This model provides us on the x-axis the quarantine duration and the y-axis the imminent of infections or the number of new infections per day in the destination. This graph particularly looks at Italy and, and what would happen if it placed quarantine on Chinese travelers, which we'll get into a little bit more later on the country specifics. But what this model really shows us is what the effect of such a quarantine would be on different nations. Importantly, this red line, horizontal, represents the number of infections in a country at baseline, if there was no travel whatsoever. It makes sense that this line is horizontal, as an increase in quarantine duration with no travel would really have no effect on the imminent infections. But the rest of the lines represent some sort of testing regimen, using RT-PCR, rapid antigen, or no testing whatsoever, and have a decreasing trend, which also makes sense, as an increased quarantine duration would mean that all the individuals who are in quarantine would be cured of their disease and would go into the country and one, transmit fewer infections, and two, have natural immunity, which would increase kind of that herd immunity idea and decrease the susceptible population. In essence, what we're looking for in this type of graph is where these testing regimens intersect with this horizontal red line. In this specific case, this intersects at 10 days and tells us that a sufficient quarantine would be about 10 days for Italy against Chinese travelers. Any stricter, then Italy would be placing too strict of a quarantine, wasting resources that could be used in more beneficial methods. And any less strict, then we, they would potentially be increasing the number of infections within their own borders. Now that we understand how this model works, we can look to what these, uh, we can look at what type of data we really need for this. And frankly, it's pretty simple and able to be done by pretty much anyone. 
All that's necessary is the vaccination rate, the total population, immunity level, prevalence, and the travel between the countries. And with this simple data, we're able to find out what the sufficient quarantine would be for different countries. So we specifically focused on China after the zero COVID policy was repealed and looking at the, at the week of February 12th in um, 2024. And we can see that both looking at European countries and East Asian countries, the minimum sufficient quarantine varies significantly. Looking at England, we see that some countries like Scotland, England, and Germany require a low uh, sufficient quarantine to prevent an increase of infection, while countries like France and Italy require a much stricter quarantine. Similarly, we can see a trend with Japan, Singapore, and South Korea requiring even no days of quarantine uh, to prevent an increase of infection, while Vietnam, Thailand, and the Philippines require a strict quarantine. This really shows that geographic location doesn't have as much of an effect as we thought with regards to the increase in quarantine, and rather, it's a lot more based on the specific statistics that we'll go into more detail soon. We are able to also bring this, uh, these graphical data into a table format, which makes it easier to see what this intersection looks like. So we are able to stratify between what the different testing regimens are, whether we're using no test, an RT-PCR, rapid antigen on exit, or rapid, rapid antigen test on entry and exit. And also split between how we're getting this prevalence data for China specifically, whether we're using the World Health Organization or self-reported data, a really important characteristic that we'll get into when we start talking about the implications. We can see that with the self-reported data, there's, there's a suggested higher quarantine than with the World Health Organization data. And additionally, all these different testing regimens seem to have a slightly different suggested quarantine, recognizing that different countries need to recognize what type of regimen they're putting on different travelers in order to make the best public health decision they can for their constituents. We see a similar trend here with some of these countries, for example, Vietnam and Thailand, having different suggested quarantines depending on the type of testing regimen that they're using. Now, the important thing about this model is not just what the quarantine that it suggests are, but also the implications it has on policy and what type of characteristics are really important for us to look at both for this pandemic and for future upcoming pandemics. So we're able to make a really educated and informed decision moving forward. By far the most important characteristic on determining the minimum sufficient quarantine are gonna be travel metrics the volume of travelers, how long they're staying, and how many people are traveling in, um, as a whole. Countries with a really high rate of travel, like Vietnam and the Philippines, are obviously going to be needing a much harsher quarantine, which is why they even suggest no travel whatsoever. This is because there's just such a high volume of people coming in, they need to protect their constituents by having a stricter quarantine. Whereas countries with fewer people traveling, like Scotland, they don't need as strict of a quarantine because there's just such a small volume overall. Prevalence of infection within the destination country also has a really strong impact, as a high prevalence in the destination actually means that they need a lower quarantine. This is because, for example, in Japan or South Korea, considering they have so many people who already are infected, any new infections coming in is like a drop in the bucket. It really doesn't make that big of a difference. And finally, vaccination rate doesn't have as much of an effect as we expected um, originally, and could potentially even have a counterbalancing effect a softer quarantine could be necessary with a high vaccination rate because, well, there's going to be more people who have immunity within destination country, but also could necessitate a stricter quarantine as if the destination has, per se, 100% vaccination, any incoming travelers could actually increase the susceptibility rate by introducing people who don't have this immunity. So there's this counterbalancing force that makes it really important for us to have a quantitative method to determine what the sufficient quarantine should be rather than kind of going off of this political or social methodology. And second, as we kind of alluded to early in this presentation, it's important for us to have accurate and timely data to make effective public health interventions. There were some reports that suggested that the World Health Organization statistics for prevalence of COVID in China may not have been representative of the true infection rate. The World Health Organization statistics suggested a prevalence of about 0.006%, which is significantly low considering that China was the epicenter of the COVID pandemic and many citizens within the country had reported having a lot more COVID than was suggested. One specific article by Novazi et al. suggested that the prevalence might be as high as 22.7% looking at Chinese travelers to flights in Milan. We opted to use a middle ground estimate from a paper by Fu et al. which looked at self-reported infections by Chinese citizens, which gave a prevalence of about 0.1%. Now, when we look at this type of different data, looking at the World Health Organization versus the self-reported metric, we see that there's a significant change in the suggested quarantine. For Scotland, for example, with an RT-PCR, 
the World Health Organization suggestion gives about zero days of quarantine, whereas the self-reported data suggests three full days. This means that countries need to have accurate and timely data so they can make a strong public health decision, or else they might be inviting more infection than they would have otherwise, or might be making too um, incorrect of a judgment call. Without this accurate data, countries really have no bearings on what type of public health intervention is necessary for them. And finally, the minimum sufficient quarantine model really provides a helpful tool, not only for this pandemic, but for future pandemics as well. It's very easy to use and is able to help use um, all the data that different individuals have from the government level to the citizen level to determine what type of quarantine is actually necessary. It can be adapted to future pandemics as well and for different pairs of countries, making it truly versatile and, use and usable in a prophylactic setting as well. The model is by nature very conservative, suggesting the strictest possible quarantine that a country could possibly need to prevent an increase of infection specifically due to travel so that any other resources that could be used in this quarantine could instead be used in better methods, like case finding and tracing, so that countries are able to best allocate their resources overall. Thank you again for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions.